And hello, everyone. I'm Mary Beth Marsden, and welcome to GBMC's Greater Living. We're coming to you live, so we want to say hi to everyone who's in our live audience and our regulars who seem to come once a month. It's so good to see you. It's becoming like a family. And all of you who are joining us online uh, watching us live today. So we are wearing red for a reason. We're talking about our lifeblood, like literally our blood, right? <laughs> There's a reason why we have that phrase. Uh, joining us now is John Wes Haynes. Wes, thanks so much for being with us. He's with the American Red Cross Biomed. He's the district manager of the donor recruitment department, which is so, so important uh, for the Red Cross. And so we're gonna talk about giving blood, why it matters, how you can do it, and every other question you might have. And I should remind you, too, that we take questions online. So if you're on Facebook right now, feel free, ask a question, and we'll try and talk about it and get that question answered for you, or at least, at the very least, uh, give you a place where you can go and find the answer. So I have to say, Wes, and we were talking about this a little bit off camera, too. Over the course of my career, I've done umpteen uh, stories on blood donations and um, and the critical need for blood, uh, the safety of blood donations, et cetera, et cetera. And I think sometimes we get oversaturated um, with hearing about it. So it wasn't until I started delving into what we were talking about again today that I thought, wow, I really need to revisit this. Um, I, like probably a lot of people watching or a lot of people out there for sure, say to themselves either, it's been a long time since I've donated, I really should get back at it, or I was denied for some reason um, and I should really get tested again, especially when you reach a certain point in your life, I think, where you know people who have needed it. Right, people who've been sick, people who've had cancer or have cancer, and how much of a difference that you can make. It isn't this the very least that you could do. I mean, really, I think those are the thoughts that you probably hear all the time, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, the challenge is, is that the need is always constant. You know, we we had disasters, weather storms, mass casualties, all those things happen, and people come out in droves. They want to donate, they want to support. And what so many people forget is that most important blood during a disaster is the blood that was already on the shelves, the blood that was already donated before we knew there was a disaster. Because we need to be able to mobilize that blood quickly and get it to the donors who need it right then and there. And so it's really easy to ask for blood when there's something on the TV that reminds you about it. But the fact that we need it regularly, we need to keep our shelves stocked. That's the most important thing that my team and I do is try to make sure that there's always blood on the shelves at the ER, the hospitals, the medical facilities, before, during, and after the disaster, before, during, and after the surgery, before, during, and after the car accident. Okay, so I'm going to probably throw some questions out there, and you're, as you said, you're not a medical doctor, you're not a hematologist, no. and there are places you can go to find those answers, but just in the very basic, and I was thinking, I was like, blood, you know, we know we need it, right? It keeps us alive. What does it do exactly? So in the simple terms, it carries oxygen through our body, right? And carbon dioxide. So it, that's what it does. And it feeds the organs and it absolutely is um, necessary. So we're gonna talk about to um, sort of the, the, the lifespan of donor blood and that can be really delicate. Um, and that's why when people give blood and they think, okay, I've done it, but whether it was used or not, is an unknown to you. However, it's chances are they're going to need you to come back again. Um, so let's just start the very basics and um, let's start with numbers. I was shocked to read that A, only 38% of the population in this country is eligible to give blood. Okay, that's correct. So the, you're elite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the sad news is, and the news that I know you're constantly battling against, is that of those 38%, only 10%, if n maybe 10%, do so. Uh, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. 
So there's a lot of reasons why people don't donate blood, and we understand that. One, it does take some time. It does, it takes, it takes you making the commitment to go out there. It takes you sometimes eating the healthy diet beforehand, making sure you do all your process. And I know that we are constantly putting the, the ask out there. We know in the American Red Cross and the other blood donor organizations out there, we are constantly asking for your blood and asking you to donate because of what we talked about before, that we need it on the shelves before the disaster. And just what you mentioned there, because so few people are eligible to donate, and of those people who are eligible, such a small percent actually donate, it's important that those who are willing and able to come out and donate as often as possible. So we are, we do try to put new messaging out there. We also work with a lot of schools and our hospital partners to try to make sure we're reaching everybody and making it as convenient as possible. Yeah, I want to cut you some slack here because I think I know a lot of people who have given before and then they feel like once they give, oh my gosh, the robo call from the American Red Cross <laughs> is going to start on my phone and they're not going to, they're going to get their teeth in me, right? And they're never going to let me go. It's such a warped way of looking at it. And I'm sorry because I felt that way at times before. Um, and so I, I'm, you must be always trying to change that thinking. So we do it because it works. We do it because it saves lives. We try not to do it too much. We have multiple lists that we have, notes that we try to take on. But our call center department is very large. They have several different operations that they meet in. And so sometimes things get missed and someone does get an extra call. But by and large, we call on a pattern that fits with when your donor eligibility is. We let you know what blood drives are in your area that you can donate. If you ask us not to call back for a little while because you you're going on vacation or something like that, that'll go in the notes with you. So we try to respect your time. But we do it because it works. We do it because it saves lives. We do it because that 10% of that 38% of our total American population, we need you to come out and support these blood drives to save lives. Okay, so, and there are some things you can do too to save yourself time, which is finding out if you are eligible. Would that, would you say that that is sort of the first step for someone who is interested in donating absolutely, blood? Absolutely, absolutely. If you're interested in donating blood, it's really important to come out and talk to people, find out what's going on. Earlier, they mentioned the phone number, 866-236-3276. It's our eligibility hotline. You can also just call 1-800-RED-CROSS, and they can direct you to different pathways if you have questions about this. And there must be just sort of a list. You can go to the Red Cross and just find a list of bullet points you know, that could kind of either rule you in or rule you out. So if you go to redcrossblood.org, slash rapid pass, you can go through and answer a lot of the questions. There also is donor eligibility information and a lot of other good information on redcrossblood.org. However, I will tell you that sometimes that they may talk about a subject and you'll need to get more information. So for example, my mother-in-law lives in Mexico. And when I go to visit her, if I fly into Cancun, go straight to where she lives in Tulum, and I stay in those two cities, I'm deferred for four weeks. If I travel outside of those cities and go to certain other cities, it could be a year deferral. So it's never as simple as I went to Mexico or I took a cruise and we stopped here. There's a lot of details that are important. And so the website is great and it'll give you a lot of good information. But if a lot of times the specific details, you're still going to want to call the eligibility hotline. And we do have a graphic up too that we just want to mention. Uh, these are just some uh, bullet points here of people who would not be able to donate, at least at maybe a particular time. Correct. And uh, again, I'll, I'll reference there. You see you travel outside the U.S. It doesn't mean just because you've ever traveled outside the U.S. that you're not eligible to donate. It's just that's a topic that if you did that, you should get information and find out if your travel defers you, and if so, how long. Some tra travel is only for four weeks or six weeks or a year, and you may have traveled just years ago. So again, just because you see it up there doesn't mean that's the only thing that can defer you, and it is important to get more information, either from our eligibility hotline or our website. And I think you have to look at that as a positive, because, you know, for a long time, years and years and years ago, there were questions about the safety of donor blood, and now look at what you go through to kind of really make sure the hoops that you jump through to make sure that all the blood is safe for donation. Absolutely. We are heavily uh, followed FDA regulations. FDA actually can come out and check any of our blood, times, blood drives at any time to see what's going on and make sure we're following all the rules. FDA is very involved with this process, not just for the American Red Cross, but all blood donor organizations in the entire country. So we're regulated to protect your blood as much as possible. All right. John has a question. I want to get to that just so people know that they're getting answered. Actually, I actually have a two-part question. Okay. Um, how much blood can you donate each year? That's question number one. And question number two, how do we know what blood type we are? Those are great questions. So the first answer, how much can you donate each year? You can donate every 56 days if you donate a whole single unit of blood, which is about one pint. So you, every 56 days, it's about two months, six times one pint. So about six pints a year. If you do our double red process or our power red process, you would donate every, other, every 112 days, which is a little bit longer. And you can only do that a certain amount of times a year. So that changes a little bit. But most people can donate six pints a year over the course of the whole year. That's six times. As far as how do you know your blood type. 
If you don't know your blood type, that's okay. We don't we get that question all the time is, I don't know my blood type, can I still donate? Yes, please come and donate. And if you go to your doctor and say, hey, can you test my blood and get it tested and tell me what blood type it is? You're probably gonna get charged for that. But if you come to us, donate your blood, download our app on your phone, you'll find out in about three days what your blood type is. And that's when we'll associate it with your account and it'll populate. That's how I found out I'm A positive. Do you find a lot of people don't know their blood? Do you guys know your blood type? Raise your hand if you do. And then, this then you... audience is above and beyond average. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm O positive. Wow. So I just know that because I, I used to brag about being a universal donor. But what good did that do you guys? Because I haven't donated in so long. And I feel I have guilt. And so I am going to rectify that on Excellent. Valentine's Day, which real quick, we'll be putting in plugs throughout the course of this hour. And one of the reasons that we're doing uh, this subject today is because there will be a massive blood drive at GBMC on Valentine's Day, a great way to show your love for other people who would need something red from you on that day. Absolutely. If you look down below, you can sign up at gbmc.org slash Red Cross. Okay. We also had another uh, graphic up here before this information about the drug, the blood drive on uh, February 14th. And it also talked about some other things that could rule you out. Um, I was once denied uh, the ability to donate one time, and it was not because I was underweight. <laughs> so um, I think it was because my iron was too low. So that can happen. So there's some, some more information. We talked about the frequency. We talked about um, if you should be feeling well, hopefully. Certainly not. I've had the flu recently. Uh, and you have to be at least 16 years old. I'm sure you have people who are younger who would love to participate. Um, and you have to weigh at least 110 pounds. So those are just a couple of, of things. Um, and so when someone goes and they are, and that's hard to be denied, I have to say, because you get kind of up for going and you get sort of psyched to do it. Um, but I'm sure you tell people, just come back, you know, <laughs> fix whatever it was, if, if it is fixable, and come back. Absolutely. And so sometimes you may not even realize that you have low iron or low blood pressure. When you come to us, we talk about we'll go through a health history screening. We'll test your iron. We'll test your pulse, your blood pressure, your temperature. And we'll go through all that to make sure everything appears that you're going to have a healthy donation. And so you might find out some information that you should know about your blood. Um, but yeah, the low iron part, most people who have low iron, uh, if they just eat a nice high iron diet for a few days ahead of time, such as your strong meats, your leafy greens, some of your beans, that'll bring your iron up enough. Myself, I'm a vegetarian, and so I take an iron pill every day to make sure that when I want to donate, I can donate. Another benefit, too, and I know you were kind of leery about talking about this, at least specifically, because they're not FDA-approved studies that you use in your literature and when you're trying to recruit people to come donate. But that is, there have been some studies done, and if you go online, you can read about them. And, you know, get whatever information that seems to make sense to you, but there have been studies that show that there can actually be some health benefits to the donor who is donating blood. Um, so that's something to think about too, and that may be an extra incentive to participate. I have found that there's lots of reasons to donate, and the health benefit, the knowing that you're saving a life, I often ask the question, how often can you save up to three lives in one hour? When do you have that opportunity? I was in 911 well before I was up here talking about blood drives, riding an ambulance in a fire truck, and very rarely was it three lives in one hour. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And we're going to have a personal story coming up in about a half hour. So another reason to consider donating blood, especially if you've never done it before or not a regular donator. You know, this is a, a question I'm sure that came from a young person uh, because, wow, I mean, everybody's getting ink these days, right? So the question is... If you have a tattoo, what are the issues there, and are there any issues? So that answer is going to vary a little bit depending on where you got your tattoo. So the deferral could be up. What if you don't remember? So, <laughs> 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 so the answer is it's going to be up to a year. So if, you have, if you've had a tattoo for over a year, you're fine. If, you're not, if you've had it within the last year, uh, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and call the eligibility number that we talked about, 866 Two three six three two seven six or one eight hundred Red Cross if you didn't write that down, and they will tell you about your history with your um, with your tattoo and also with piercing. Sometimes the way they do a piercing can matter too, and so you can still call that number. But generally speaking, that just referrals will be less than will be no more than a year. Does it matter if you've had the tattoo removed? Do they still want to know if you just? 
Absolutely. So the ink process and everything else like that, if you got a tattoo and then two months later you got the tattoo removed for obvious reasons, and then uh, you're six months down the road, you should still let us know. Okay. We do have a question from Robin who asked us um, earlier um, via Facebook, what is too low for a blood count and what can I do to bring it up? And you talked about eating, but uh, what is too low for a blood count? So that's going to vary between men and women, um, your iron levels when you come in. And so we will test you on the spot. And I'm hesitant to give out, again, the specific information because if you had one time where your iron was below that marker, doesn't mean your iron is going to be that way when you come. So don't worry about the specific number. If you know you got a history of low iron, it's okay. Try to a high iron diet before you come in. If you're, if you know that your doctor has been worried about your low iron level, talk to your doctor before coming in. All right, John, we have another question. Actually, we have, actually, we have two questions. Great. Um, if you need a blood transfusion, how are we protected from receiving infected blood? And the other question is, even though we answer rapid pass questions, do you test blood for prohibited contents? So when you come to donate blood, after you go through the health history process, you get on the bed, you'll notice that after we take the full pint of blood, we take a couple tubes. Those tubes are actually put barcodes to associate with that pint of blood. The pint of blood goes to our, our depot and it gets processed. At the same time, those tubes get overnight shipped to one of our, pro our testing plants. And all those tubes will be tested for various illnesses, various diseases, HIV included, syphilis, some of the HEPs and things like that. And so while the blood is being processed to go out the door, these tubes are being tested for all the things that that the FDA and CDC say these are the things we need to be looking Quickly, out for. Quickly, I would imagine. Yes. So uh, and I'll, I can mention this later, but the platelets that we take out of your blood has a shelf life of five days. So we have to get those platelets into a donor within five days. And so we usually know the blood is tested within the first few hours of it getting to the plant. You mentioned HIV testing, hepatitis testing. What's, what, what are the privacy ramifications there for a donor? So it's an interesting process that we go through. Um, I mentioned that when the blood is taken, the barcode is going to be put on the tubes. The barcode is going to be put on the bag of blood that's taken to our depot. And so if something is spiked at the office, uh, sorry, at the testing plant, that barcode is going to be sent to a computer signal to dispose of that blood and a letter gets automatically generated to the donor who donated that blood saying this is something that spiked up. I'll also tell you that we're overly cautious in our testing. So I myself, when I was about 21 years old, uh, donated blood and I got a letter in the mail that said you, you came back as potential HIV and so please go talk to your doctor. And obviously that was a very scary thing, but I went to talk to my doctor, I got tested, no problem, no issue. But we are so cautious and what we do, sometimes things are a little oversensitive and you get those letters. And so what I had to do after that is I had to go and I went to the Red Cross and they gave me a chance to test my blood again and I came back okay and I'm now a regular donor. Okay, do we hit the second part of the question? Okay, awesome. So you brought up platelets and this is confusing for a lot of people. Um, when you donate blood, your blood is broken down sometimes, all the time, um, and, and what, what, where does plasma come in, and where do all the other types of donations fit into this? Okay, that's another great question. So when everyone talks about donating blood, you think of the red blood cells, and that is, in fact, the most important thing that we collect, the red blood cells, going to trauma patients, going to... Um, the surgery patients and everything else like that. Do you, know, do you have a breakdown? Is it mostly to trauma? I don't have the breakdown okay. with me, no. Um, but we have the, so that's where the red blood cells are going to say. But we also filter out the blood and we collect your plasma and your platelets. And that's where we get the one donation of blood can save up to three lives. Your red blood cells, your platelets, and your plasma. And so the platelets have a shelf life of about five days. And so like I said, those are going to be processed, tested, moved out, and shipped to recipient very quickly. And oftentimes those will go to your cancer patients going through chemo treatment and things like that to help the, their, their body heal. Because the process of chemo will often kill or damage your platelets. And so we provide those platelets that allow those donors to continue living. And then the plasma oftentimes goes to burn victims and other people like that who just need um, their blood is getting replenished. And so that will be, that actually has a lifespan of about a year, which is a little bit longer. So do you always break, I guess you would say that blood that hasn't been broken down is whole blood? Correct. Okay. Do you always break down the blood or do you keep hold of the whole blood until it something is needed. So we break down the whole blood as soon as it gets back to our department. Okay. And that's how, the, that's how the platelets get out. Now we do have some procedures. So we have something called power reds. It was mentioned earlier. It's also used to be called double reds, where it's slightly different. We hook it up to a small machine and we take just the red blood cells from you. We put the platelets and the plasma back in. We actually give you some saline. So most people who donate uh, power reds actually feel a little bit better afterwards because they have that extra fluid in them. 
And then that is just red blood cells, just donors who have the more needed red blood cells, such as your O, such as you. So O positive, O negative, A negative, and B negative. And this process doesn't take those pla platelets and plasma, but it gives you even more of what the hospitals need the most of. And so that's the power red. We also have a process for platelet donation. We don't do that on our field, our field drives like the GBMC drive, but we do do it at our fixed sites, and that's where we just take platelets. It is a longer process, but when you think about the shelf life of five days and how many people need those platelets, the extra time to donate is important. And then we don't do a lot of this, but there are ways to donate just plasma for donors that have this particular type of plasma that was very useful. Can I talk about the power blood for a minute? I just want to back up. I like the term power blood. I feel like you're powering up, you know? So if I go to donate and they notice I'm O positive, and they say, whoo, we could really use uh, either more of your blood or uh, how, can you really get really detailed on what that means? So if you go to a blood drive, and there are a couple other requirements, there's a weight requirement and a few things like that, but if you go to a blood drive, you know your blood type, and they go, wow, you'd be eligible to be a Power Red donor. Would they get you? all excited, right? Yeah. And you're like, ding, 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 ding. So <laughs> we definitely want you to do it, but be aware that it is going to take you 10, 15 minutes longer to donate because your blood is going to be filtered and something's going to go back into you, so it's a slightly different process. It takes a little bit longer, but really, that's about it. And then we can't call you for another 112 days because you won't be eligible for twice as long. So you get the ad There's your benefit. bonus. There's your bonus. You mentioned that we lie down to get the blood, but I've heard too that you can sit. Some people don't, I mean, my mother cannot stand to be in the dentist chair where she's lying back. It's very uncomfortable for her, and some people have a hard time with the lying down thing. It's funny what people have a hard time with, right? You've but I'm sure you've seen it all. So can you sit in a chair too? So our beds, you actually generally aren't gonna be lying down during the process. Our beds are lay flat for your feet and then the back will come up and we can set that pretty much to your comfort level. So you can sit up pretty high if you want. Most people, somewhere around a 45 degree angle, but the bed allows us, so let's say after you're donating or during the process you have to feel a little tired or not feeling totally 100%, we can lay it all the way back, give you a cold washcloth and help you have a comfortable experience for the rest of the process. But no, you're not gonna be laying flat back most of the time. You're gonna be at about a 45 degree angle. And some people have difficult veins. What do you, what do you tell those people? I mean, there's all, I'm sure you've heard every comeback mm -hmm. in the world, right? Oh, my veins are really hard to find, or I could never get an IV, or. So I will never promise a 100% success rate. That would be a little bit um, silly of me. But I will say, the benefit of going to our staff when it comes to donating blood, this is really what they do day in, day out, every single day, and they are good at it. They aren't, it's not like when you go to other uh, medical facilities where the person who's drawing your blood also does this and also does that and is worried about three other things. They are looking at your vein, they're getting your blood, they're saving lives, and that's what they've been trained to do. That's their primary focus, and they are incredibly good at it. So if you had a history or you've had some bad experiences, I will always say give us a try. Give us a try, and if you decide that maybe this isn't going to work, that's okay. But these professionals spend so many countless hours training to get ready for this, and they are amazing, they are patient, and they know some tricks that some other people blow your mind when it comes to trying to get that vein to pop up for them. Yeah, it's like going in the hospital, you always want the good IV nurse, right? The one who's really does it a lot. <laughs> and the other thing is, what we, because we want it to be a good experience for you, we don't typically go, f what, in the medical profession, we call it go fishing, right? Where you go in, you don't get the vein, and we don't sit there and try to find it. Because for us, it's more important that you have a good experience than necessarily getting every single pint of blood. So if we go in, we don't get the vein, we may have our charge person who's the senior person on site take a look at it. And if they feel that it's not worth trying to go back and forth and it's going to make a bad experience for you, we'll just say thank you so much and maybe come back another time. But I will say if you have a history of that, going light on the caffeine, eating a nice healthy breakfast or lunch, whatever time of day you're coming, and drinking lots of water. Those things will make a huge difference. A lot of people don't realize that large cup of coffee they had 20 minutes before they tried to donate is going to make it harder to get a good stick on your veins. So go light on the caffeine, lots of water, good healthy meal. All will help you have a better experience. Do you find people are usually morning donors or afternoon donors? Does it matter? I think donors are convenient donors. So most people donate when it's the most convenient for them to make it happen. That's why we go to places like GBMC, we go to places of work, Elks Lodge, Moose Lodge, all those wonderful places to make it as easy for you as possible. People will typically donate when they find it convenient. Is young blood better than old blood? 
<laughs> That's a wonderful question. I will tell you that I have seen people 94 years old donate blood. Yeah. And their blood is just as good and just as important as that 17-year-old first-time high school student at that high school blood drive. So blood is blood. Um, a lot of people, that brings up a good question, though. Is there an age cutoff for donating blood? And the answer is no. The older you get, though, sometimes the more experiences you have, the more um, medications more you're on, you have. the more tattoos. Maybe you're 78 years old and you just got your first tattoo but no more importantly it's usually the medications and the medical history that will defer you however if you find out that you deferred at any age there's tons of ways to help out with a blood drive registering donors when they come in hanging out with them at the uh, cookie table to make sure they're feeling okay recruiting somebody else to donate in your place so just because you find out you're deferred or you've already know you're deferred it doesn't mean you can't help the blood drive there's tons of things you can do and I would encourage you to get involved and help whether it's a GBMC or a blood drive closer to you there's still ways to help out and if blood drive isn't your passion red cross has a passion for you i promise but right now we're focused on the blood so we hope that, is to throw that in there. hey um you and i'm going to throw this in there too even though we're really hoping that everybody turns up for the gbmc blood drive if you for some reason can't make it don't let this stop you uh, from giving blood because as you said there's a blood drive somewhere Right. Absolutely. And again, we want it's you like to it's five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> we want you to support the GBMC <laughs> blood drive. But if you go to redcrossblood.org, you can type in your zip code and find a blood drive near you. Did we hit your question already? OK. Um, you know, I don't think people realize you talked about platelets and they have a shelf life of five days. Right. I mean, that's really incredible. Do you have an idea about how much I don't want to say goes to waste because somebody donated and it mattered, but it really depends on what the need is in the moment and how fresh the blood is, right? So how much do you have to discard? I don't have a number for you, but I can tell you it is not the majority. The vast majority of blood that you donate, products from your donation will go to save a life. Yes, there are some times where some blood type, maybe we have overabundance, and there, is, there have been times, but that is really a minority of cases. Do not, I would not encourage anyone to spend a lot of time focused on that. It's more important that we have it. And the other thing is, in that conversation, though, you never know when the next disaster is going to happen. You never know when the next need for a mass amount of blood to be transported is. So it is better to have more on the shelves than less every single day. Which leads me um, to another question. And I'm sure there are people who would like to know um, that their blood stays local or in state or maybe helps their neighbor. That's a great question. We get that a lot because Red Cross is the only true national registry of blood. So before I answer that in the detail, let me say that when there is a disaster, when there is an incident, because we're national, we can move our blood the fastest and the quickest to where it needs to go. And so sometimes it is a cascading effect where if you have an incident in Las Vegas, the cities around may move some of their blood there quickly, and then the cities for there may share theirs and may get cascaded through the country that way. And because of our national registry, not that every blood organization doesn't chip in and help, but we can do it the fastest and the quickest and often with the biggest supply. However, those disasters, those incidents don't happen all the time, right? So the vast majority of time on a regular basis, if you donate here in this area, it's going to stay here in this area. It just doesn't make sense to move it around. Logistically, yeah, right. Logistically, I mean, we don't do time. that. Right. So yeah. we are all over the country. There are blood uh, donation centers all over everywhere you go. And so it stays here. I'll also say, though, when it comes to specific blood types that are needed. So if you have a patient who has a rare blood disorder who needs a special antibody or needs to not have a special antibody in their blood because of how large we are we have the best ability to find donors that can help that and so there's a little girl in florida right now that we're desperately looking for for certain types of blood from the middle east and so when we're testing it we see more people than any other blood donor center so we can help identify in those cases getting blood to with that little girl in florida so i won't promise you your blood stays here locally i will promise you your blood will save the most lives mm. and go to where it's needed the most but if you're curious most of it and generally speaking it stays here which is important of course if you just go to register that now you have this pool of people and you can reach out for that little girl i want Absolutely. to know what happens uh john another question actually we have two questions regarding okay. eligibility um the first question from our uh, studio audience is does getting vaccines affect your eligibility for donating vaccines for flu or shingles and the other question is if i take a daily aspirin should that be discontinued before great donating? question all right, so two good questions there. Uh, first of all, vaccinations. Sometimes when you get a vaccination, there may be a time deferral for you. I'm not aware, but I won't promise you, of any vaccinations that are indefinite or lifelong. 
But if you have a vaccination recently, again, I would call the eligibility hotline, 866-236-3276, and you can get all those details. And as far as taking an aspirin every day, um, my suggestion is talk to your doctor before you think about coming off, if you're doing, doing something on a regular basis. But yes, aspirin and some other medications, we might tell you if you take in the last 24 hours not to. But I would never encourage you to donate um, by taking, changing your daily process if it's working for you without talking to your doctor. I'm sure it's amazing to me that a, a tiny baby aspirin, what is it, 84 milligrams, I think? It, it, is it? 83. 83. So it would actually thin the blood enough to make a difference uh, in the donation. And, and, why, and why would that? Is it that they couldn't stop the blood flow? Is that the concern? So again, I'll, I'll preface, we are overly cautious. So when we set up, well, again, not us, the FDA and the CDC set up these regulations, but when they set up these guidelines, they're not looking for, okay, if you're three, there's a problem. They're looking, if you're at one, you're too close to three and we don't want to risk anything. We want these donations to be as safe as possible. So understand that, and again, this is a good question when it comes to your blood pressure, your pulse, your iron is level. When you come in, just because we tell you you're deferred, yes, go talk to your doctor, but I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't sit there and say, oh my gosh, they deferred me for my iron levels. There must be something wrong with me. Go talk to your doctor. More than likely, you're probably fine. You've probably been that way your whole life. It's just we are overly cautious on the line where we draw in the sand to make sure we don't even approach on those kind of things. And as far as blood thinners go, yeah, there is concern right now because we are sticking a needle into your skin and we are taking out the blood. There's also things to consider that the bags that we use, they have certain amount of chemicals in them to prevent the bag from for the blood, excuse me, from coagulating. And so one of the things you'll see that's heartbreaking is someone donates blood and for some reason they're not able to fill a bag. We can't use that blood because the number of chemicals in that bag won't be proportional to the amount of blood. And so that's where some of the things like blood thinners. So the mixture has to be just right. And that's another reason why we have to be very careful of the medications. Which makes your job harder and you've got to really recruit, recruit, recruit more and more people because, because there's a line drawn. So we, so we can talk about when you have a blood drive. We have a goal, right? Maybe it's 45 units of blood, but we'll need to see 60, 70 people just to make sure we hit that goal because people will be deferred. We call it a Q&S. That's when you can't fill a bag even though everything else works. So there's other things that can happen. Um, and so the, the, when we talk to our, our sponsors like GBMC, who's a wonderful sponsor, and they get it and they are passionate about this, it's not about reaching that goal. It's about filling every slot on that schedule. That's the most important thing a blood drive sponsor can do is fill those slots on the schedule. And so if it's 60, 70, 80, GBMC is so wonderful that they chase after that goal. And they're not worried about the units until afterwards. They're worried about filling that schedule because that's how we save the most lives. Not to be complacent, but I'm sure that GBMC's uh, blood drive will be a huge success. I love that it's on Valentine's Day. It has that extra kind of meaning to it. Absolutely. But you have to do this 365 days a year. How do you continue to get the excitement and the dedication and get new people to come out? So we, I mean, you said your, your main people are your return customers, but you all have to always be looking for new. So we they do a lot of things, and some of it's specific campaigns that work very well. So we are in high schools. We are in colleges. We have programs designed for high school students, for college students, to the come out. So if we can get you donating at that early level in life, get you in that habit of doing it once, twice, three times a year, you're that much more likely to donate when you get into the real world, when you get to working, when you join a, a civic club that has a blood drive. You're that much more open-minded to it. So we do a lot of programs with that. We also have programs where elementary schools and middle schools where we'll go in and we'll teach the students about the importance of a blood drive and then we say hey we're gonna have a blood drive in your school in two weeks go home ask your parent ask your aunt your guardian your uncle to come back in your honor in honor of you and donate a pint of blood and we'll even give you a little thank you gift so we're teaching the young students about it we're recruiting them to be recruiters of their adults in their life to donate blood and so that's another way we get out there we have seasonal campaigns last summer we took um, something called a missing types campaign and we sponsored with a lot of large organizations we asked them to either remove or cover up or darken the O's, the B's, and the A's in their name and ask the question, if we were missing A, B, and O from our name, how who much would is, we be? Yeah. who would we be? And then the same thing, if you're missing the A, B, and O blood types, who are you? And so that was a marketing campaign we did throughout the summer. I think you'll see it again at one type or another. We also have programs designed at certain ethnicities. One thing that a lot of people don't realize is that blood... We think of blood as blood, right? And that's absolutely true in most cases. But if you're someone who has to get a blood transfusion or donation on a regular basis, sickle cell, for example, if you have sickle cell disease, you're getting blood very regularly. Well, at that point, it goes beyond just 
A, B, positive, negative. You want as close as match as possible, and ethnicity matters at that point. So we're talking about the African American population. One in 600 African Americans needs a regular blood transfusion for sickle cell. But yet most of the blood doesn't match that ethnicity. So all of these things are things we're constantly going out there and talking to people about, promoting about, and trying to find new ways to talk about it, new ways to sell it. So our blood is not just enough, but it's the right blood. We talk about the importance of the Power Reds donations, where it comes in. So sometimes we'll do campaigns that are focused on the right type mix, is what we call it. So those O negs, those B, the B negs, the A negs, the O positive, those ones are the ones that go on the ER shelves for the person coming in that we don't have time to find out what blood type they have. So we have different campaigns that we utilize. We have different seasonal campaigns that we utilize. And we're go trying to go after as many populations. And we also found a lot of the workplaces that we deal with, they find benefits in doing blood drives with us. So GBMC does this as a great relationship with the American Red Cross. But we'll go to other businesses, and they'll find that this is a Businesses that aren't healthcare yeah, related. That aren't healthcare related. Right. And we'll find they'll find out that this is a low cost employee engagement program. And all of a sudden their employees are like, wow, I like working here because once every other month I get to take two hours and I get to go save a life and I don't have to drive out of my way. I don't have to get up early on a Saturday morning. I come to work, I check in, and then I go to the blood drive. And my company cares. And my company cares. Yeah. So you'll find that all the time. Um, so we have several different programs that we're constantly utilizing and we're constantly trying to get it out there because it is always needed. And it's, it's funny, we have this uh, process where you'll see when there's a disaster and you'll see our, our blood supply rise and it's amazing. And those donors don't come back in 56 days. And so now when you talk about the need, it spikes right back up and some of them it pulls forward and so people who normally donate in April are now donating a month ahead of time. And so now we're scavenging, trying to find new ways to get those donors to come in a month later because the pattern that we normally follow isn't there. I will also say that during the winter time, people are traveling more often. People are seeing their family. They're also doing activities that may... They don't want to go out. Yeah, they may not eligible. And so fewer people are coming to donate. And then we have our winter storms. We're thinking that we might have some snow this weekend. If we have snow this weekend, we will likely cancel blood drives. And that's blood that was promised to our hospital partners. So when we talk about the need for the blood, it is so regular, so constant. We have to be ready for the disasters, not just because of the need blood rise, the need of the blood will rise up, but because the donations will, sl will stop. We won't have, you look at some of the flooding that we had down in the Carolinas. Think about every single, if, we, if they run five blood drives a day, the flooding cut them out for a month. How much blood did our did they lose in that area? Fires in California. The fires yeah. in California. So those are the things that we're constantly looking at, that we're constantly dealing with. And so we try to, I, and forgive me for using this term, but we try to almost leverage those kind of things to make sure that people are still thinking about it. You know, we don't want to turn it into a positive, but we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can. And so people tend to respond, but then six months later, yeah, it wears off. it's a challenge. Yeah. And so that's where you see some of our high school programs, our college programs, um, our workplace programs are so key and so important to what we do in saving lives. A lot of people think of, the, oh, there's a, there's a blood drive center um, not far from where I work, or there's a fixed site, where this is what we call them as fixed sites. There's a blood drive right there. They're, every day they, they open the, most of our blood, almost all of our blood when you come early, comes from these mobile sites that are out in the community at your place of work, at your civic center, at your school. That's where the blood really comes from. And so people think that because we have those centers that we're okay, that that does enough, but it's really not. It's these drives like GBMC does that saves the most lives and does the most good. Yeah, it's amazing what peers can do too to make, you know, maybe you've never done it before and there's a, someone you work with who says, oh, it's so easy. You've got it. You know, there's a little peer pressure I'm in a good way. I'm not opposed to a little peer right? pressure. Absolutely. John, do you have another question for us? Actually, low iron levels is, is a hot topic keeps coming up. So we got two questions here about that. How, do, how can someone find out if their iron levels are low? That's the first question. Second question is, I've been deferred due to low iron levels. Should I still come to each blood drive to try to donate? Okay, so a couple questions on that one. How do you know? And again, you can always call our eligibility number, 866-236-3276, and find out and talk to one of our professionals about it. You can talk to your doctor about it. If you have a history, regularly low Sorry. blood drive, I would sincerely, regular blood levels, I would sincerely tell you to talk to your doctor about it and get their, their opinion on it. Now, if you have a history of low blood and you've been deferred from our blood drives before, there are some things you can do. And so I would say try some of our steps before you give up altogether. And like I said, I was deferred for low iron, so I take an iron pill every day. I thought for a little bit if I just took it for the week before, or two weeks before, it'd be okay. But I found out I really do need to take it every single day for me to be able to donate. I also know some people have had great success doing a three-day high iron diet. That's your leafy greens, your big steaks, some beans and things like that will do a great job. But I would say if you've been deferred once or twice, 
Let's see if we can do some things to get you up. Talk to your doctor. Our website, redcrossblood.org, has a ton of ideas, and it goes into lots more food than I just listed right there on ways to do it. So go there, check it out, talk to your doctor. But eventually, if you get to the point where you're, you're constantly low, you're always below it, there may be another way for you to help the Red Cross and help with the blood drive than just by donating. And I think the key there, too, if that's, that is an issue, you do need to talk to your doctor. I mean, there may be some a lot of other things going on Absolutely. that you need to look in uh, first and foremost. So we have a comment? You know, Mary Beth, just sitting here listening to this, how about you and I set our appointment for the 14th at GBMC Let's and do donate it. together? Instead you of having lunch. And me, right? The two hosts. Okay. Let's do this. After yeah. lunch. How about that? You're on. We'll schedule our appointment today. <laughs> you know, um, when we were talking about young people, I, I was just, and this is, I don't even know, but <laughs> what about habits? What about quote unquote bad habits you may have? Does that affect your blood? Smoking, vaping, are those things of concern? So I, there's a lot of studies out there about smoking and how it affects your pulse and your blood pressure. And both of those could be things that when you're going to a blood drive could have you deferred. So I won't say smoking necessarily is going to be the reason, but it could affect your pulse, your heart rate, and things like that. And even good habits could, or habits that aren't good or bad can sometimes lead to a little bit of deferral. So we talked about drinking caffeine in the morning. So when do you drink? Spacing that away from the blood drive so you're not doing it right before. Drinking plenty of water to counterbalance that. So there are some patterns. Not eating. One of the things that we run into high schools a lot of times is students don't eat breakfast. And so the students that have the blood donation after lunch are usually a little bit better than the students that have their 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock appointment because they hadn't eaten anything all day. And so I wouldn't say bad or good behaviors, but there's a lot you can do with your behaviors to help make sure you have a successful donation. And a successful life. <laughs> that mean, is right? absolutely. <laughs> Wes, thank you so much. Wes Haynes uh, from the American Red Cross and really talking about a great blood drive that's happening on February 14th, the day to say I love you and give a little bit of blood at GBMC. So I hope that um, all of you turn out and all of, all of you who are watching us live do too. And uh, I know it'll be a huge success. So Wes, thank you so much for uh, answering a lot of questions. We really appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's been fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And Don Scott, uh, my comrade has been at GBMC. He's there a lot. Uh, he does a great deal of volunteering and interviewing, and he just loves it. And so we really want to talk with a nurse who knows all too well um, how priceless blood is, donor blood is. And so let's go to him now. Most people know about the need for blood donations when it comes to major catastrophes and emergency situations. But some might not realize just how great of an impact they have on everyday situations. I sat down with registered nurse Judy Feeney at the Sandra and Malcolm Berman Cancer Institute at GBMC to learn about how blood transfusions are used to help combat side effects of some cancers and the treatments used to fight them. We've been talking about giving blood and the importance of giving blood. You're actually on the other end of the spectrum, correct? I am. Professionally, I'm an RN here at GBMC in the Infusion Center where we frequently transfuse our patients. Um, personally, I'm a longtime Red Cross blood donor. Okay. So I see both sides of the spectrum. Um, from, a, from a clinic perspective here, we do a lot of transfusions on uh, cancer patients predominantly, not solely, but predominantly that's the source of the anemia is the cancer or their treatment. It's blood going in instead of coming out. Right, right. So we call that transfusing. All of our physicians are oncologists and hematologists. So that allows them to um, diagnose um, anemia and to make decisions as to whether red blood cell replacement is necessary or not. Um, with that being said, um, the patient then has to have what we say is a type and cross match done prior to each blood transfusion, which gives the blood bank some pretty specific information to make sure that the transfusion blood that's going to be given to the patient is a good match for that patient. And everybody knows how what giving blood is like, what happens there, or they should. Uh, is there any difference when the blood is going in? The difference is time. It, a unit of blood at the Red Cross is donated 15 minutes or 20 minutes or you know, some very short period of time transfusing blood based on the patient's heart rate and their vital signs and their blood pressure can take two hours, um, has to 
you know, can take as long as four, but that's a little unusual. And they can leave immediately or? Yeah, pretty much. We do, we do observe them for 30 minutes after the blood is finished and take another set of vital signs, um, and then they're free to go. No little cup of Gatorade and a cookie? We do have cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, so does, so does the donor center. There you go. We have cookies, too. You're absolutely right. <laughs> okay. And I guess we've been laughing at things, but, but how important oh. to these patients is a blood transfusion? Absolutely critical. We, we monitor, of course, someone that we know that's going through cancer treatment. We monitor their blood work very frequently. Okay. Um, so we generally catch things like anemia before they become dangerously low. Um, but for many of those patients, even though it wouldn't be a critical result, um, they're not eating well, their energy is down, they're fatigued, they're many times not participating in their family or friends' activities and events. Um, once they get that blood, usually within a day or two, they're feeling much, much better. What's the greatest misconception about blood transfusions that you know of? I, I think many people who have not been involved in being a Red Cross blood donor themselves mm -hmm. don't realize the degree of scrutiny that's involved. I don't think many people realize how cautiously and carefully that blood is looked at for viruses and infection um, prior to it being accepted to be a donor unit mm -hmm. when it's sent to our blood bank at our hospital or any hospital. Mm -hmm. um, they also do a complete set of testing. So it's really very thoroughly looked at before it's transfused. How urgent is the need for anyone who can donate blood to do so? Well, there's, there's no manufactured replacement for human blood, is there? So the need for the blood donation is always very great. Mm -hmm. But I think the main thing in my mind is the benefit that I see. So um, we see people that you know, otherwise would, would not be um, having the same quality and the same enjoyment of their life um, walking around anemic. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's very rewarding once they get blood. And we generally, many of our patients, we see back again in a week or 10 days because they're coming back in for treatment. And that's always exciting to see. And they're very, they're very joyous in sharing that. Like, I got that blood 10 days ago, and it's made such a difference. I feel so much better. Um, so it's nice to see that, mm -hmm. you know, spark back and that enjoyment of life. So the next time a blood drive comes to GBMC, just remember, you'll not only be saving someone's life, but you'll also be helping a neighbor who's battling cancer, a small act with a big consequence. And be sure to save me a cookie. For Greater Living, I'm Don Scott. All right, somebody give Don a cookie. I can't believe we talked with Wes for 45 minutes and never once mentioned the snacks. <laughs> that must have been a really good interview then because the snacks is kind of the go-to when you dug, haven't talked about anything else, right? So, but there are cookies, right? Right, thank you. So it's great to hear um, from the nurse's perspective, from the medical personnel about how crucial it is to have a blood supply. And, um, but really I think what totally will, uh, put you over the edge as far as deciding to try and become a blood donor is to hear from someone who literally whose life was saved um, by having uh, the uh, the availability of donor blood when she needed it in this case. Um, so joining us now, and she was so excited to do this too, uh, to tell her story. Uh, Samantha's here, and um, I want to call you new mom, but you're really like, you're not so new at this She's anymore. 17 months now. Yeah, and I, we have to get right to the, the picture because I love a baby picture. Do you have that current picture? Oh my gosh. Okay, so this is right that's, after. That's right after she was born. Yeah, she looks like an angry little old man there. Can we just like savor this for just a minute? And she does not. She's exquisite. Thank you. And um, you look, you're glowing. Uh, I, I know you don't think it, but you are. And so you had, I just want to backtrack from this moment, you had 
a pretty good pregnancy. I had a great pregnancy. By the book, we would say. It was wonderful. I felt pretty good. I mean, I was tired at the beginning, of course, but I was healthy. I was active. It was great. You were working because I I worked right up until, yeah, I wanted to go to work the morning that I went into labor, but I didn't. So you went into labor and just, I, I love a good birth story. Do you guys like a good birth story? The women out there must. I know. I can't get enough of them. And they never go exactly as you think they're going to go. But this one sounds like it kind of went. Labor was fine. I I followed my birth plan to the T. I wanted to have an unmedicated natural birth and I did. I stayed home. (laughs) <laughs> stayed home for 10 hours and then when it was time I, I went to the hospital she was born uh, about seven hours later and um, it was fine it was great I lost a lot of blood during the birth but that's not during delivery um, but that is not really when things took a turn for the worst I went home um, knowing that I was severely anemic and then I started taking an iron supplement and eating lots of spinach and iron fortified cereal. So you go home after Mm -hmm. two days? Yeah, I went home right on time. Two days. You have a newborn for the first time. This is your first child. Mm -hmm. And we all know what that entails. So if you have children, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Um, the it whole was, sleep thing, the whole food thing, but and now you have to be careful with your iron intake. Right. So it was intense, but it was intensely normal. It was everything I expected. And then um, one night, two weeks after she was born, so a full 14 days later, I'm up at 4 a.m., uh, in her nursery, I go in there, she cries as, as they do when they're two weeks old and I go in and I start rocking her. I don't turn on the light because, you know, they say, don't, don't run in and turn on the light. You're going to startle them. And then they're going to have a harder time getting back to sleep. So I start rocking her and then I hear she's having a little baby blowout. So I get up and start to change her diaper. And that's when I feel, uh, a lot of wetness and a lot, um, a lot of, blood gushing out of me. So that's when I turn, um, so I'm, I don't know what's going on because I never heard of anything like this happening two weeks and after. And it's 4 a.m. and you're kind of, it's 4 a.m. I'm a, exhausted. Right. So I put on her little nightlight and I can see that I'm standing in a pool of blood and I turn around to look at the, the rocking chair, which of course is an ivory cream colored upholstered <laughs> chair. Uh, that now it looks, was, we should say, yeah. it was, that now looks like the scene of a crime. So that's, I mean, you can smile about it now, but right. it, that must have been, I can't imagine what was going through your mind. Yeah. Just to even figure out what the heck was going on. Panicking. Never, yeah. this is not something, um, it's very rare and this is not something that any of my dozens of friends with babies had ever told me, you know, by the way, two weeks later, you might start hemorrhaging. So it's 4 a.m., you're bleeding, what do you do? I get my husband up, and he's like, why are we up? And I'm like, this is what I've been doing, by the way. Um, so we get him up, and I toss him the baby. Were you fairly calm? No. Okay. <laughs> so you were screaming. I wasn't screaming, but I was I was trying to remain calm, because I thought that's what a mom would do, but I was panicking. Okay. I mean, I was happy it was something wrong with me, right. and not the baby. Right. Um, but for a minute, you didn't, did you know? You just had to like survey her. I, I could tell it yeah, was, okay, was my okay. issue. Yes. Um, so then I toss him the baby. I go into the bathroom to try and see if I can get it under control. And that's just not going to happen. How did you, did you feel faint? Did you? Yes. Panicked, faint. I, um, for the, those two weeks when she was born, um, when she was just born, I was kind of doing everything and not letting my husband do anything. So that was the first time he ever changed a diaper. Um, was right then when I was standing in Trial the bathroom hemorrhaging. Yes. Um, so I, I called my OB and she says, you need to go to the hospital right now. So we get some garbage bags and some towels and put them in my new car that I bought for my new baby uh, so I don't ruin it. And, um, and we head on into the hospital. Where they so um, no calling nine one one. I didn't call nine one one. I figured it was best. To, they, there's an OB on call at all times. I figured it was best to go uh, call someone who knew my medical history. Um, but nine one one, come to think of it, might have been a good option as well. Um, so we head to the hospital with our 14 day old. Who, by the way, this was my husband's first time putting her in the car seat. Yeah, you have to take the baby, right? Because what? You have to take the baby. It's Hi. four in the morning. So he puts her in the car seat. I, I'm like, you can strap her in. You can figure out. It's not that hard. I look at her. She's just wearing a diaper in there. 
What time of the year was it? It was July, but still okay. hospitals are cold. So I say, put an outfit on her right now. And then he he grabs an outfit and it's like a 12 month outfit and her little arms are oh under. I, you know, I'm starting to get stressed. Right? Like, yes. I'm starting to get stressed for you. It was stressful. Moment. So we get there, they do an ultrasound. It turns out um, there's a large piece of my placenta still inside me and attached. Yeah. It's very rare. It only happens to about uh, two to three percent of people, um, but it did also happen to Kim Kardashian. Okay, so yes. you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> um, so then, what happens? So surgery. Surgery. Yes. So surgery to remove the placenta and detach it um, from the uterine wall, and. Um, that was fine. No one really wants to be, I mean, I was very worried. I didn't know if I was going to be able to breastfeed. I didn't know, you know, I had never left my baby before. Of course, um, my mother was watching her. Um, my husband was with me. Um, and then after surgery, um, I have a really hard time with painkillers. So I was vomiting from the painkillers and I was still losing a tremendous amount of blood, still bleeding all this time later. Um, and then they finally do some things to get it under control, but I, by that point, am so weak that I can't even function. I can't lift my head up the pillow, off the pillow. I can't hold my baby. I can't sit up. I definitely can't uh, get up and walk to the bathroom. I had to have a catheter, um, so it was awful. Is this an ICU situation? No, you're you're back in labor and delivery okay. and postpartum. Um, um, but it was really, really rough. I remember just thinking if only I could sit on the edge of the bed, that would be the best feeling in the world. Mm. It was bad. So enter the blood. Yes. Yeah, so every time the doctor comes in at that point, she says, you need a blood transfusion. Um, but they can't force you. You have to, um, consent to it. And I keep saying, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> I just want it to be over at that point. I just want to, for them to say I can go home. And she keeps coming in and saying, you're not getting out of here until you have a blood transfusion because you have to be able to walk. We can't send you home if you can't walk and you can't walk if you can't sit up and you can't sit up if you can't pick your head up. So you're not going to go home. So but do, do you have any idea how much blood you lost? Did they give no. you an estimate? Okay. No, I don't know. Um, so finally my husband is like, what, why don't you want this blood transfusion? Everyone is saying this is what you need to do. And I just, I'm like, I don't know. I guess I just think it's weird. Like who wants someone else's blood in them? I feel like that's for people who were in a car accident. Um, but, uh, no, I needed blood and I needed it badly. So I got the transfusion eventually. And um, someone sits with you for the entire time to make sure you don't have a reaction. You can have an allergic reaction. And I got the transfusion, and overnight. What type of blood are you? I, I can't even remember. Don't know. They told me at I, the I time. I don't blame you because yeah. I'm sure the whole thing was a blur. It's hard to remember yeah. anything, honestly. Um, so it took about four to five hours. I got a few bags of blood overnight. Someone sits with you the whole time, and then in the morning, I just felt the best I've ever felt in my life <laughs> to this day. It was like the best shot of espresso I've ever had in my life. I just wanted to like, I felt like I was on top of the world. I couldn't believe, I felt so silly that I had waited that long to get it because it's a really great feeling. Well, makes me want to get one. You should, everyone should do it. <laughs> Blood transfusion. Yes. But um, I can't imagine how they, so you were turning them down to get one for a day until they finally just really got to you and said, Yeah, it was over a day. Crucial. And then I was just thinking like, okay, I need to do this. I want to go home. I want to be with my baby. I don't, I want to, that's all I want. And so um, I just had to power through and I, I did it. And I'm really glad I did. And more importantly, I was really glad that there was blood there for me. And because it wasn't really, uh, at that point, a life or death situation, but I really, really needed it in order to go home and be with my baby. And I just had never really thought about blood donation that much in the past. And I was so grateful to have blood. And I guess the moral of the story is you never know when you're going to be the one lying in bed who needs to receive blood um, because no one plans it that way. 
it just happens. No one does, right? So yeah. you look at this whole blood donation push with a completely different set of eyes. Yes, I'm so grateful now. And I, I always have to think whenever I see all my coworkers going to give blood, you know, I wonder if it was one of them who uh, who helped me. And um, I was wondering if you think about, like, I wonder who that, that was. Like, I'm so... I thought like, about You can it. thank that anonymous person for the rest yeah. of your life. I just have a completely different outlook on giving blood now. And if you can give blood and you are capable of it, I ask that you please do so because you never know who you'll be helping. And I was incredibly grateful to have the blood available to me when I needed it. Well, we're all grateful too. Yes. And now your baby is. She is 17 months now. She was born. Oh, there she is. She was born on 7 17 17, and now she's 17 months old. I love it. Yes. She is beautiful. Thank you. Oh. Well, yes. you are the perfect example of why we should all at least try. Yes, please um, donate February 14th. That gives us, uh, takes us right to that uh, mm -hmm. announcement again. February 14th, there's all the information for you uh, early in the morning, in the afternoon, whatever is convenient right there at the conference center. And um, you will not regret it, we promise. So, Samantha, thank you so much for... Um, sharing your story. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you. And it was great to talk about our blood today. And uh, happy Valentine's Day.